conversation concerning that Rwanda policy, but I remind you of the headline in one newspaper today, the best-selling newspaper, actually, the Daily Mail. Raab's threat to ignore Euro court rulings is their front page. The Raab to whom they refer, of course, is Dominic Raab, Justice, Justice Secretary and Deputy Prime Minister, who joins me now. Thank you for coming uh, on the show, Deputy Prime Minister. What would make you carry out this threat? Good morning. Good morning, Nick. Well, uh, look, let me be clear on the position. We intend to stay... Uh, our plan for a Bill of Rights, as we've already uh, published, uh, intends to stay uh, a party to the European Convention. But what I would say is I think it's important that not just states' parties, but also the Strasbourg Court comply with its mandate. We've seen in relation to the injunction challenges to the deportation flights uh, to Rwanda that the Home Secretary has, I think, valiantly been trying to um, uh, push through. And, and let's be clear, let's have some moral clarity. She's doing that to stop the human rights abuses, which we see with the perilous journey that migrants are taking and the criminal gangs that are, are preying and profiting from it. Um, I think that it's we, we, in relation to those legal challenges, we had the High Court uh, dismiss them and say it's actually it's OK to proceed. There was going to be a full hearing later on in a few weeks. There's no irreversible harm that will be done. The Court of Appeal backed it up. Uh, there was no leave to appeal to the Supreme Court. I don't think it's right in those circumstances for the Strasbourg Court, which has no power based in the Convention, to try and instruct us uh, with an injunction of its own. And so I think one of the things a Bill of Rights can do is address that squarely. But if it doesn't have... And, and you're right, you, you sort of played three home fixtures and you won all three, the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, the High Court. You had an away fixture in Europe and sadly it didn't go your way, so the game was off. But why, saying that they don't have the power... What is to stop you saying we are actually going to continue? Because you will be aware, not least as Justice Secretary, as regards the issue over prisoners' rights to vote, we've ignored ECHR before, Justice Secretary. Yeah, there's a difference, of course, between uh, injunctions and full adverse rulings. But what we're talking here is a, is a power of injunction. Strasbourg Court doesn't have it. Uh, it has assumed it from its own rules of procedure, which are internal only. Um, I think that that is a good example. And by the way, I should also say, if you follow the journey of the European Court, and I know you will have done in Strasbourg, they went through a very expansive period of expand, expanding the goalposts of human rights. They've actually been uh, showing more restraint. Judge Spano, the... I Icelandic president has been talking about uh, more an age of, of subsidiarity, respecting the margin of appreciation, allowing governments to pursue legitimate public uh, po policies. And, and that's good. This is rather a blip. Um, but I don't think they have a power of injunction. So I think the way I would put it is this. Um, the real human rights abuses are coming from those criminal gangs preying on this trade in misery. And it is important that we respect the, the parameters of the European Convention. But it's also important the Strasbourg Court does. And actually, you mentioned prisoner voting. I was the Minister for Human Rights in 2015. And we had this dialogue, and I think it is a dialogue, between the UK courts and Parliament and the Strasbourg Court. And I went along to the Committee of Ministers and I explained why we wouldn't give prisoners the vote, notwithstanding some of the, the rulings. And we haven't, and we haven't, despite all the fear-mongering and the scaremongering, we haven't been expelled from the Council of Europe. So I, I do think it's important we can engage with Strasbourg and in a dialogue. And that's precisely why our Bill of Rights will be an important reform and I shall publish it shortly. When do you think the first migrant will be deported to Rwanda? This month, next month, this year, it, next year? Well, I, I don't think I can give a precise date. The, the, the important thing to understand is that this, this um, ongoing legal challenge has been around the injunctions. There is a full hearing due in a, in a few weeks and uh, all the issues can be aired there. And I would expect and I hope, because we're confident in our position, that we get clarity from the UK courts and then we can proceed. But of course now there's a question mark about whether Strasbourg will intervene. Um, and so we will uh, need to see uh, how that goes. Do you ever see a position in which you would ignore a Strasbourg intervention? Yes, as I said, um, look, I think you've got to um, be able to engage in dialogue. I think we uh, we welcome and respect the fact that since the Brighton Declaration in, uh, around 2012, I think it was, the Strasbourg Court has recognised there needs to be a greater margin of appreciation, leeway to states' parties. We think that they need to follow by their own uh, 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 approach in that regard. Um, but, for example, with these questions, these Rule 39 interim orders, I don't believe that there's a legi legitimate power of injunction that the Strasbourg Court has. It's not grounded in the Convention. Um, and the Bill of Rights can tackle it. It can address it squarely. It can make clear that as a matter of UK law, those do not bind us. 
Um, that's a big, ch big, ch a significant change with the approach of the Human Rights Act, which effectively slavishly has uh, followed Strasbourg rulings and case law. Now, we must come on to something I know you're keen to talk about as regards enhanced supporters in cases of sexual violence. But just a final question as regards Rwanda, Deputy Prime Minister. Are you prepared to state your professional reputation on the fact that somebody will be in Kigali by the end of the year? <laughs> look, um, one I, migrant I, you know, in Kigali by look, year end. Look, we are um, working very hard no, on this. Rob. Well, look, you're asking me to give uh, the kind of cast iron guarantee that I know, Nick, your listeners need and, and, and hanker for. Look, I can tell you, I'm fully supportive of what Pretty Patel is doing. I think we need some, what I would call, calm focus. There's a lot of people that are going to be uh, making all of these sort of uh, histrionic arguments on one side or the other. You, I think you're, the you're, Home not Secretary, prepared, you're not prepared to put your professional reputation on getting one of these poke migrants to come. Well, I don't quite know what the courts are going to decide on the okay. main hearing. What I can tell you is I'm very confident that we set out a sensible, proportionate plan which, far from eroding human rights, will protect human rights because it will help stem this flow, this trade of migrants, a trade in human misery. Let's come very much to your brief as Justice Secretary, announcing today enhanced specialist sexual violence support to be on trial at three courts. What lies behind it and geographically where are those three courts, Secretary? So, look, uh, giving uh, victims of rape and serious sexual violence greater confidence in the system, driving up convictions is one of my top, if not the top, priority. Rape convictions in the last year have risen by two-thirds, but I'm restless to go further. There's a suite of measures we're taking, but one of the things we're announcing today to become operational uh, in October is three specialist rape and sexual violence courtrooms in Snaresbrook, London, uh, Newcastle and Leeds. These sites have been selected for trials because they have either high volume of rape cases going through them or a, a significant backlog. And the, 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 the main features around these courtrooms will be video technology, so victims of rape can give pre-recorded evidence, so they don't have to add the trauma of uh, giving testimony in front of the glare of a, an open courtroom on top of the, the terrible, appalling crime they suffered. There'll be trauma training for court staff and there'll be the independent sexual violence advisors who can really hold the hand of those victims going through. And I think that's the right thing to do, Nick. I think it's a moral duty for us to really care for those most vulnerable of victims. But also, from frankly an operational matter, this is the kind of thing that will help us reduce uh, victims losing faith and, and falling out of those cases and therefore drive up convictions even further. How will we know if this initiative has worked? Well, there's about eight levers that I'm pressing on from disclosure rules, uh, pre-recorded evidence, the operation satiria, which is basically better collaboration between prosecutors, police and a range of others. And you'll see it because the volume of convictions will keep rising. As I say, the volume of convictions in the last year has right, risen by two thirds. Um, the, I can tell you that the time from charge to completion of rape, uh, of rape cases is down by five weeks on the last year. The conviction rate, and it's not the sole criteria but has but when uh, if you compare cases that go to trial to the ones that uh, result in a conviction is up from 68 percent to 71 percent uh, i think you need to look at all these numbers but the number one thing is is the volume of convictions going up my if you like the target i've set myself uh, and i think the government is pursuing uh, we can't set uh, targets for what the courts do but what we want to try and do with the system as a whole is double the uh, the the number of um uh, of, of rape cases that get to the Crown Court. Um, if we do that, we will make a step change in the number of convictions. Last couple of questions, if I may. Uh, Isha and Walton, your constituency, I won't need to remind you how many people rely on the railways to get to and from their places of work, many of which, of course, are in London. Uh, and we have these said to be devastating strikes taking place at the start of next week. A reaction to that, what it means to your constituents, Deputy Prime Minister? I think the strike action by the RMT union is deeply irresponsible. Of course we need to look again at the structure of our railways. We've provided a huge subsidy to see them through the pandemic. And as, as, as working and commuter habits change, of course we've got to um, look at that sensibly. Um, I think that the strike action is deeply irresponsible. For my part as constituency MP, and I think for uh, your listeners across uh, London, but also across the country, I want to stand up for commuters 
and uh, rail passengers. I, I, I am just, uh, not only do I think RMT are behaving deeply responsibly, I'm, I'm shocked that Labour have been so openly backing the RMT and frankly the Liberal Democrats have been as usual lily-livered on the subject and have, have not been clear. The, the only ones that are saying this is wrong, we stand up for the public, uh, the Conservatives, and certainly I'm shouting it from the treetops in terms of the commuter services we've got in East Room Alton. All right, last uh, subject, Lord Guiters, of course, resigned as the Prime Minister's ethics advisor. How much does this damage Boris Johnson? Well, uh, look, uh, I would thank Lord Guy for his work. Um, it, it's not clear why he's gone. That, I think that's the... Um, he's given a statement that said it was right to go at this time. All I can tell you, Nick, is that he was looking for an extension of six months with Number 10 uh, this week. He got a pretty gruelling uh, scrutiny from the Committee of MPs. I know there was a commercially sensitive matter he... Ah. He, he was asked to advise on well, in the national interest. What is interest. that matter, uh, Deputy Prime Well, Minister. it's commercially sensitive, so I can't go into it, which I know is frustrating. Um, but what I would say is there'll be an update from Number 10 later on today, but it's not clear to me the grounds on which he actually decided to leave, and he, he'd been expressing his desire to stay on for a further six months uh, just a few days ago. So, I, to be honest with you, I don't know more than that. And we don't have his resignation letter published yet. Do you know why that is, Deputy Prime Minister? I don't, um, but I've just seen the statement that he's given, which didn't really give much of an indication. Do you imagine we'll learn more today? Yes, there'll be a further update from Number 10. All right, I'm grateful for your time today. Thank you. Justice Secretary and Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab appearing here on LBC, where at two minutes after eight, the news is next. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global Newsroom, Downing Street says Boris Johnson was surprised by the resignation of his ethics advisor, Lord Guy.